So 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 11 through 12. So women, we strongly teach and preach this. Women cannot pastor a church. Women cannot pastor a church. Why? Because it is considered to be a leadership role. And if you look at 1 Timothy yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I just lost it just now. Oh my goodness, my brain's not working. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 12, you'll notice that she has no role to teach, to have an authority role over the man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll read verse 11. Let the, war, uh, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. So she's got to be silent. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So based on Adam and Eve, the curse of sin, because Adam and Eve sinned against God, that was part of the curse of the woman where they, she was supposed to submit under a man and she is not to take authority over the man. Now, obviously, liberalism, they would like to interpret this to the extreme and then claim that basically women... Based off of those verses, she is supposed to be silent and submissive and just follow whatever the man says. No, is that what the verse says? No. Did you read the book of Acts? We ought to obey God rather than men. You got to realize this. Did you read the book of the Bible where Sarah, she called Abraham Lord. Now that will preach right there for some of you women actually about how much you got to respect and honor your husband. She called him Lord. But that doesn't mean that she was silent, submissive, where she had nothing to say, where she can actually say something where it would correct her husband. You might say, no. Yeah, Sarah, she told Abraham to take away Hagar and Ishmael. And what did God say to Abraham? Listen to her. <laughs> How about that? So this doesn't mean that a woman has no say whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if you're, the woman's role is supposed to support the husband, right? Isn't she supporting the husband when she's trying to tell her things that can help him? Yes, obviously. She's not being silent and doing whatever he says. Especially if he's going to lead your family to the wrong and lead you to the wrong. You better speak out concerning that one. Amen. So you got to understand that fact. But a lot of people, they misunderstand these verses as a woman can't do anything. Now, here's another problem. This is so wrong where you're silent and submissive where you can't do anything. No, did you read the verse behind that? There is so much you can do. Really? Yeah. What, why did the verse say in verse 10, but which becometh woman professing godliness? Do you want to be a godly woman? Do you women want to be a godly woman? If you want to be a godly woman, with what? Good works. Yeah. She's got to do good works for the Lord. So there's a lot of work. You can do for the Lord. Oh, there's nothing I can do. Okay. Before I even go through different works that you can do for the Lord, I don't even have to go through them if I just simply give you one thought-provoking thing. How many men are not pastors? Now, since most men are not even pastors, can you imagine how many works that they are doing for the Lord? So that means that you women can't do that? Use your head now. This We're talking about a pastor role in the ministry. That's what we're pointing out right here. A leadership ministry over grown adult men. In the ministry. The context is grown adult male, and the context is the church, the ministry. So how many men do not have this kind of role? There's a lot of men. So aren't they doing a lot for the Lord? That means you women can too. What can I do for the Lord, Pastor? Well, before I go to, uh, okay, one, it's not even something so special. It's just doing what you're supposed to do. Your basic works for the Lord. That's one you can do. Read your Bible. Pray. Oh, pray. Don't you think prayer is going to be very powerful? We don't need prayer from you. <laughs> There's a lot of power in prayer. A lot of people, they want to preach and gain popularity, but they don't want to pray and not gain any attention. What did Jesus Christ say? You Pharisees who flaunt yourself, it's better that you're hiding in secret and praying in a closet. How about that? 
So you can pray. You can witness. You can soul into somebody. Witness them about Jesus Christ. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5. If I'm going to get technical right here, didn't you know that you women are ministers? I thought that we're not a pastor, past, pastor. I thought that's what you said. Well, the Bible says that you're a minister. No. Yeah. Okay, what does minister mean? Minister means to serve. To... It's like I'm ministering to him food. I'm ministering to him clothes, etc. It means to serve. So everyone is called to minister, but minister practically the gospel. How about that? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice right here, verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to what? Us, the ministry of reconciliation. So notice right here that God gave all of us what? The ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? 19, the gospel, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, one thing that bothers me is this. Why would you women complain and whine about not being able to pastor when you have not even led one soul to salvation? You know what it shows right here? It shows me something that's deep in your heart. You just want popularity. That's what you want. And that includes a lot of men, too. Amen. They want to preach on the pulpit so that they can have their name recognized among churches. And then you ask them, how many souls have they led to salvation? How about that? I'm, I feel like preaching here, but i got to keep going. Basic works. So giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Basic works. Your church attendance. Your offering. Trust me, man. If we're going to cut off all the women from giving offering in the church, you know, we'd lose a lot of money. <laughs> So there's a lot of things you can do for the Lord. There are, brethren in the, uh, there are brethren in the church that you can pay attention to, that you can minister, help them out, comfort them. Think about that. A lot of things that you can do for the Lord. So basic works, and that should be plenty for you. Okay, another thing is this, is that notice that the context is what? Grown adult males in church, right? So because it has to do with grown adult males in church, think about this. Then this does not include women. This does not include children. So look, I don't know why you think there's nothing you can do, all right? Males do not cover 99% uh, of the world here. There's a lot of women out there who need help. There's a lot of children out there who need help. Now, let me say this too. If you think women are so important, which I'm sure even the most liberal woman would agree with that, otherwise you wouldn't go for a, a feminist movement. If you really believe you women are important, why do you get so infatuated? Why do you get so infatuated on women empowerment, but you're not actually focusing on ministering women? See, it's because you want to include men in here. That's your problem. But I thought women, I thought you would think women are more important than men probably. And then if women are more important than men, shouldn't you be content with just ministering to women then? And trust me, if you're ministering to women, that's enough work. That's a lot of work. Okay? Look, as a Bible-believing pastor, I wish that I had a wife who take care of women. All right? Because you got to realize this. One, now this is very true. Women can minister better to women because they feel like they can relate more. Do you know how hard it is for a pastor to minister to a woman? Do you know how much prayer I'll have to do? How much thinking I'll have to do? How much trusting in God I'll have to do? Especially at my age, and not just even my age, even my nationality. So because of this, that's why it's very difficult. Do you know how many women are needful in the ministry? I mean needful, man. Okay, let me ask you this question. Do you know of many great women that you can boast about today who are serving the Lord Jesus Christ and doing great things for the church? It's mostly the men you think about, right? Why is that? Does that show you women are focusing so much on a liberal power movement rather than a Christian empowerment where women need to be ministered? Where are you focusing on, huh? What are you focusing on? 
So not only that, I'll tell you what's, who's more important than women and men today. It's the children. You might say, why? They're the next generation who will take over this whole world. That's why there's a lot of conspiracies out there about what they want to do. They want the older generation to die out. They want to brainwash the new generation with the schools and all that. Do you know that if we, if we have women, let me tell you this. If you have women who is just a mother and, all the, and that is her only job, do you know that you've got one of the most sacred responsibilities ever? You might say, well, you know, there's a lot of things I can do. You know one thing I noticed about women empowerment? And this is not just women. This is males, too. You know what the problem with everyone is? They want to get some kind of position where they want popularity, fame, and they feel like they get power and attention for themselves. It's selfishness. It's not about ministering to others. Why do you want to be a woman pastor? Because you really want to minister to others? Or is it because of selfishness, something where it feeds your egocentricity and pride? you got to think and pray about that for a while. If you're a mother, you got one of the most sacred responsibilities because you got a job where you're going to change something that sometimes not even a pastor can do. The pastor, all he can do is preach once or at best three times or four times a week to the next generation. And only one, ba one hour at best. One hour at best per service. You, mom, you got a 24-7 job where you have a better effect to change them more than the preacher. Now, don't get me wrong. Preachers and sermons are necessary and powerful to change a person's life. But I'm going to tell you something. Who's going to spend more time with them is mothers. They change the generation. If you don't think that's important, let me tell you this. My mom changed my life. And that's the reason why I'm able to minister to thousands of you online. If you don't think mothers are that important. Think about that. Here's another thing right here. We're also going to turn. Um, we're going to look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Book of 1 Peter. Now something I want to say. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. So we see women ministering to women and to the children. So think of a lot of things you can do. You can preach and teach to women. Can I tell you something? Don't you think that women nowadays would like to hear a subject that relates to them? So we need women who preach subjects that relate to the women because women can better re relate to women as well. I mean, for crying out loud, man, for crying out loud. We need them to preach and teach to the women and the children. So it's in the context always with women and the next generation, the children. So we need them to preach and teach to women and children. So think about a lot of positions you can do to preach and teach to the women as well as to the children. Sunday school classes, I mean, trust me, Sunday school classes, we need women that can minister and teach to the children. That way they can grow in proper admonition. We need women who can preach and teach to fellow women where they can get under conviction. They can learn something, grow in grace and knowledge of the scriptures. You can write books. You can write books. You can publish materials. Now, some might be upset with me on that one, but no, I believe that you can write and publish some materials where women can get a blessing out of it, where women can get some kind of nourishment and ministry. Here's another thing right here. You can also minister because, look at 1 Peter 3, go to your other hand at 1 Corinthians. There's another thing I want to show you here, which is interesting. Didn't you know that there was a woman who actually was trying to correct a scholar? Didn't you know that? How about that? Didn't you know in the Bible that there was actually a woman who corrected a scholar and tried to guide him toward the right path? So you got to realize this, is that we need women who actually stand for Bible-believing truth and show them what's wrong with their teaching. Now, you might say, I thought a woman is not supposed to teach and preach. The context, remember, is what? Grown adult males in a what? Church setting. This is within a church setting right here. Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. This is so obvious. So it's obviously at a church setting and in your house as well. So most of the context is referring, this is more interesting. When it talks about submission, more than the church, it's more about husband and wife. That's what you're going to notice. So that's even stronger right there. So it gives you a lot of leeway, women, on what you can do for the Lord in the church, to be honest. 
Okay, but anyways, so this is uh, writing and publishing. And then also, look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And notice right here what the Bible says. Who did Paul train at verse 2? And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy. With his wife, what? Priscilla. So Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Now look at verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, and what? Eloquent man. Notice he's an eloquent man. He's very brilliant. And he's from where? Alexandria. That's where all the philo uh, that's where all the PhDs, the scholars, philosophy came from. Hmm. What did the Bible say? Look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when, who? Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Wow, what about that? How about that? Yeah, we need women who will actually tell them what's the right doctrine. We need that. I mean, if we have newcomers coming inside the church and the person believes about vision or speaking of tongues, yes, I would, I would like it. I don't care who you are, brother or sister, would tell the individual, we don't believe in that in our church. And then show them scripture and show the person what's wrong with that belief. Of course I want that. Do you think I want go tell go talk to the pastor? No, don't talk to the pastor. I've got enough people up in line. I don't don't talk to the pastor, man. We need we need men and women to show right doctrine. And here's the thing: sometimes I wonder if you women are just trying to be lazy and then you'd give the men the job to teach someone the right doctrine, and then you whine and complain about lacking empowerment. How about that? No, the Lord has given you many things what you can do to empower yourself, do great things for the Lord. But it seems like to me you're not interested in those works God has given to you. You're more interested in the work that you prefer. That's something strange to me. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Here's another thing. Now... I'm not saying that Bible believers believe this. Uh, your pastor, though, seems to believe this. Now, I could be wrong, okay? I could be wrong. But this is one thing I notice really well. Whom the Lord seems to favor more concerning people who struggle uh, being alone and concerning prayer wise and suffering is the women more. So I have a, now I could be wrong, but it seems like God seems to tend to favor more on women who are suffering. Why is that, Pastor? I don't know. Maybe it's because I do know this. Women, they tend, psychologically speaking, this is, uh, this is even proven as fact at secular schools, women do go through more psychological stress. So because maybe that's how they're born and they're built, that's why the Lord tends to favor them more. But what you're going to notice is that God favored more on women on their suffering and prayers. He sees them as more of a need than men, actually. Because men, we're built within a system where we tend to resist more. Now look, if you, it's a biological fact. If you have more testosterone, <laughs> testosterone than estrogen, all right, and women have a little bit more of that compared to men, there's a difference right there. So the thing is this, is that, see, there's something that we're all made to be different. So the Lord knows when he gives a certain work or he plans a different plan for a person, he fits it perfectly for the person right there. He always does that. That's why he's a dispensationalist. That's why 1 Corinthians 12, he gives diversities of gifts. That's the reason why God made different sexes, all right? And two, okay? There's only two, okay? Amen. There's only two genders right there, okay? And uh, God called people to different callings. God does these things for a reason because he knows that's how you function, that's the most healthy, and that's the most beneficial for your life. Now, 1 Peter chapter 3, look what the Bible says concerning men, all right? He didn't say this about the women. Verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not what? Hindered. He only gave that to husband. He never gave that to wives. Now, I'm sure that there are women whose prayers get hindered, but for a specific mention in the Bible concerning husband and wife, you'll see that on husband. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at wives in the Bible, it's more like the Lord hears the cry of the widow. Here's the cry of the women who are suffering over the mothers over their baby, over their losses. Did you read the Bible concerning Rachel? 
when she finally lifted up to the Lord, then the Lord answered her prayer. What about Hannah? Hannah wanted a child and the Lord heard her prayer. The Bible mentioned about, there are verses in the Bible where the, God hears the prayers and the cries of the women. He says that more specifically. So you see right here, you got something that's more advantageous right here. But here's another thing, based off of 1 Peter chapter 3, and then we'll close right here, this does not mean that you lack honor. No, you do receive honor. Didn't the Bible said that the husbands are to honor the wife at 1 Peter 3, 7? Not only that, the Bible says that the book of Ephesians chapter 5, I believe, that the husband is supposed to treat the wife as much as he would prioritize his own body. So how much the husband is selfish with himself, he's got to give that same amount to the wife. Good. That'll preach right there. But the thing is this, is that this does not mean that, see what they're trying to give to you? They're trying to give this to you where you're abused, right. that you can't do anything. That is pure, sheer nonsense. That is not biblical. That is satanic. And if you're a man who calls yourself a Christian and does these kind of things and use verses to justify your sin, let me tell you this. You are definitely not right with God. Right. You are not following God. That is not God's principle. That is sent from the pits of hell. You just made up that thing yourself. Don't you dare say the Bible taught that. Don't you ever dare say that. The Bible never taught that. So you women do receive honor. But here's something strange that I find very interesting. When men, back in the older days, they knew that they were to treat women respectfully and honor them. And where we had the mentality where... Uh, if you uh, punch a woman, that's something disrespectful. Even today, okay, even today, okay? If I punched a man compared to when I punch a woman, what would you think about me? See, you would think more about, like, me punching the woman, right? That, boy, this guy is totally messed up. See, we had that kind of, why? Because we know about women, how they should be treated more respectfully where we would open the door, even at the older days, they would open the door when women would walk in. When, uh, during the older days, men would actually uh, uh, pull up a chair for the women. Yeah. Even during the dark ages, the middle ages, where women were, I guess, uh, oppressed and stuff like that, they believed in chivalry, they believed in some things where they were supposed to be courteous and respectful to women. So here's the funny thing, though, is that today's liberal world, they don't like that. Yeah. They don't like it when you open the door for them. They're like saying, oh, I'm independent. I can do that for myself. See what the problem is? The problem is this. The problem is, is that it's not that you're being abused and you lack a role. It's that you want things to go by your terms that is anti-biblical. You don't like anything that the Bible says. That's your problem. It's not a matter of, I didn't get enough honor. No, you get plenty of honor. You get plenty of honor. We're going to take it more seriously. If, some, if there's two guys fighting in the church beating each other up, yeah, I might take discipline on that. But if I see a guy beating up a woman on the parking lot, dude, that person's not coming back to church, period. See, there's a difference. We all know this, okay? This is within human nature right here. So there are many things that you women can do. So start. why don't you start using your head now and do something for the Lord? Especially if you have children, I think you've got... That one job is too much of a full-time responsibility. So I think that much alone is good enough. But if you want to do more for the Lord, man, God bless your hearts, then start praying. Because God tends to hear the prayers of you women something more. Um, he tends to favor that more, in my opinion. There's nothing more sacred and more powerful than a mother's prayer, as the saying goes. There are hymns, there are even hymns dedicated about mother's prayer, believe it or not. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China. You know what? He was uh, anti-Christian, and he was college-educated. You know what changed his life? His mother's prayer. And she left a track for him to read. How many of you women have been passing out tracts? How many of you have been praying, huh? Here's another uh, famous woman. John Wesley, one of the most uh, famous men ever, and probably the top two men who will be the most holy up in heaven, him and the Apostle Paul. So probably the two most holy next to God Almighty. You know what he had? He had a mother, Susanna Wesley. Do you know how many biographies are just dedicated to Susanna Wesley? Just on her. When John Wesley was saved out of the fire, her mother gave a famous quote that became famous throughout all the books. Is not this a brand plucked out of the burning, out of the fire? But guess what? John Wesley's wife was a witch. She did not learn to honor her husband, submit to her submit to him and to help him in the ministry. In fact, she would even disrupt the middle of the service. And John Wesley lived and died with her. 
How about that? But John Wesley at least had a good mother, even though he didn't have a good wife. Now, you women have an important role, and Satan wants to use you. Satan wants to use you women. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because who does Satan tempt first at the Garden of Eden? Not the men. Women. All right? So you got to think and pray about that one. All right? You women are some, you have a very important responsibility.